Today we're going to be looking at another video by Kyle Hill. Specifically this one here, the Castle Bravo disaster, a second Hiroshima. For those of you who don't know me, I'm Tyler Fulce. I'm a nuclear engineer with a little over 10 years of experience in the commercial nuclear power industry. From engineering to operations to emergency response. I don't claim to know everything there is nuclear, but I can certainly share some knowledge. Let's get right into it. The Castle Bravo device sat silently and sun-kissed in the morning of March 1st. It was housed in an ugly concrete bunker constructed on an artificial island on a beautiful reef off Namu Island in Bikini Atoll. An array of parallel vacuum tubes ran from the bunker to a data bunker 2.2 kilometers away, ready to measure various variables. So the Bikini Atoll, SpongeBob lives in Bikini Bottom. So are they saying the radioactive, the radioactivity from the nuclear weapons testing in the Bikini Atoll caused Spongebob and all of his little friends to mutate and create their own little undersea civilization. To be fair, that would make about as much sense as anything else on that show, so why not? Numerous towers with mirrors rose up out of the man-placed sand at different distances, ready to reflect the first few milliseconds of the explosion's light to ultra-fast and very distant cameras before the towers themselves were vaporized in what was to follow. Within one second of the explosion, the fireball of the U.S.'s first fusion bomb was almost five miles wide and hotter than the sun. Almost just as quickly, the civilians, scientists, and military personnel in attendance knew that something was unspeakably wrong. Nuclear reactions happen so quick. One second, the reaction was ancient history. There's a unit of time for nuclear weapons, or there's a unit of time for nuclear reactions called the shake. A shake is 10 nanoseconds, or 10 to the minus 8 seconds. So the reaction, everything, all of the fuel that was going to react for within the, the conventional explosives, the, uh, the fission stage to create conditions hot enough to cause fusion to occur, and the fusion reactions, they all happened a long time ago by the time you saw the fireball. It's fascinating how fast this stuff is. Within one minute, the mushroom cloud was higher than most commercial planes fly. In under 10 minutes, the results of the explosion would be 100 kilometers wide. For context, 100 kilometers is the same distance from the surface of the Earth to space. Okay, we'll see what he means more specifically by consequences, but the fireball's not that big. <laughs> not even close. <laughs> the fireball was reportedly seen up to 400 kilometers or 250 miles away. It's As bright. L. Douglas Keeney writes in 15 minutes, General Curtis LeMay in the countdown to nuclear annihilation, quote, in mere seconds, the sailors sensed that something unspeakably wrong was occurring. Battle-hardened men who had served in World War II went to their knees and prayed, end quote. Meaning they were off by a few orders of magnitude. Castle Bravo's yield was supposed to be six megatons of mm. TNT equivalent energy, and it exploded with 15. This right here is one of the reasons why nuclear engineers always plan for the worst, throw in some extra safety margins into it, and you do your calculations that it's not 1 plus 1 equals 2, it's 1 plus 1 equals 100, just to be sure, just to make sure we've planned for this to be a lot crazier than we initially thought it was. The Castle Bravo device was housed in an unassuming metal cylinder that weighed 23 and a half thousand pounds and was about as wide in diameter as most people are tall. Now there are many things that make the engineering and design of the ironically named shrimp device interesting, but to make the nuclear physics here as simple as possible but not simpler. Gotta love the namings, you got Little boy, fat man, and shrimp. They're clearly having some fun. And the unit of measure for time, shake, shakes of a rabbit's tail. And the unit of measure for probability of a reaction occurring, the barn, that you can't hit the broad side of a barn. A barn is 10 to the minus 28 square meters, by the way. So very small side of a barn. Very basically, a thermonuclear weapon works by chaining together increasingly destructive stages. The first stage is the primary, a fission bomb like was detonated above Hiroshima. That bomb is engineered to release its obscene amount of energy into the interstage, where expanding hot gases, plasma, radiation, and neutrons are directed via the casing's geometry and material engineering at the secondary, a reservoir of fusion fuel. Now, bombarded by neutrons, incredible heat, and a pressure a thousand times that at the center of the Earth, 
this fuel undergoes fusion, a process that can release many times more annihilating energy per kilogram than fission does. This, in essence, is how all thermonuclear weapons operate, and in theory, a secondary stage could be used to ignite a third or tertiary stage of fusion and beyond. That's how you make the really, really big ones, potentially, like Sarbama and beyond, by the way. You are somewhat limited geometrically, but if you make a device big enough, like Sarbama was so big it couldn't even fit in the bomb bay doors of a bomber. It was much too heavy to be launched on rockets they had at the time. It's a lot easier to create fusion and weaponize it when you don't need it to last for long. Again, the time scales we're talking about, yeah, you can make fusion. Keeping it sustained and controlled in a nuclear power plant, though, is a lot more difficult. And that's why we've had fusion bombs since the 1950s, but we haven't had fusion power plants, at least commercial fusion power plants yet, but we are getting closer. It is speculated that this is how Russian scientists ignited the largest bomb ever detonated the so-called Sarbamba, an explosion so unimaginably immense that measurements at the time showed the resulting shockwave circled the planet three times. Oh yeah. Fusion is ferocious. The Castle Bravo device used a solid fusion fuel called lithium deuteride. And Another thing about Sarbamba is they had an even bigger one, about 100 megatons. The one they detonated was a 50, and they didn't use the bigger one because the bomber would not be able to travel to minimum safe distance in time. The whole idea was just ridiculous anyway. Such a thing would be impractical to use in combat. It would be so easy to intercept. Different time, a nuclear device measuring contest. Isotope of the element lithium with six neutrons bonded with an isotope of hydrogen with a single neutron or deuterium. The enriched lithium used in the bomb was 40% lithium-6, which, when bombarded by neutrons from something like a fission reaction, completes an exothermic reaction to form the radioactive sort of hydrogen with two neutrons, known as tritium. tritium. Yep. Inside the hell that is a nuclear explosion, tritium and deuterium fuse to produce helium, a neutron, and a relatively large amount of free energy. By hell, he's referring to temperatures exceeding 100 million degrees Celsius. Again, it doesn't last that way for long. The fireball's not nearly that hot, but the actual, when everything is bottled up in the bomb right before it explodes, oh yeah. Energy that makes a bomb, a bomb. Lithium-6 deuteride is the primary fuel in thermonuclear weapons, and in the Castle Bravo device, it was also the fuel for the critical miscalculation. It was assumed that the enriched lithium-6 would be the only source of the bomb's energy and that the 60% of the fuel that was lithium-7 would be inert, that it wouldn't react at all. And then it did. And then it did. The day before Bikini Atoll gained a crater, the salty ocean wind was blowing, as expected, to the north. Nobody was north. In the early morning hours of March 1st, 1954, however, the wind unexpectedly and dramatically shifted to the east, over an area where a small but very present population of islanders lived. In the declassified film Operation Castle, the task force commander Major General Percy Clarson indicated on a diagram that the wind shift was still in the range of, quote, acceptable fallout. When the Castle wow. Bravo casing, bunker, and artificial island became a blinding ball of plasma, it created a crater 2,000 meters wide and over 75 meters or 250 feet deep. 20,000 people resided in the path of possible fallout, and the residents of the Ronjalop and Uteric atolls were hit the hardest. They would soon feel the effects of radiation sickness, but they wouldn't be evacuated for a full 48 hours. Every effort was made to assure the comfort and well-being of the natives. Radiation survey teams will be flown back to the atolls, at which time soil and water samples will be taken. Data obtained from evaluation of these samples will be very valuable in the Gabriel studies. It would be three years before the former residents of Ronjalop were allowed to return by the United States' Atomic Energy Commission. The Atomic Energy Commission, by the way, was a precursor to the current Nuclear Regulatory Commission, at least in terms of the regulatory aspect and as far as the promotional aspect that would go to uh, Nuclear Energy Institute as well as the Department of Energy. But wow. So they're off in magnitude and the wind direction, and they 
didn't cancel it. One of those by itself, and keep in mind this is another this is another case. If you're looking at things like acceptable levels of fallout, which is the word I would use, but there there probably are scenarios where if your calculation has enough margin, like your widest bar of error indicates the fallout won't reach this level or reach a, a populated zone, then it might be. But when any conditions change, you you stop the test. That's this, this analogy is also true when starting up a, a nuclear power plant. The procedures have you look for things that aren't just related to counts or power level when you reach certain plateaus as you move the unit up in power, or even earlier than that, when you're not even critical yet, if you see anything changes, there's so many lists of parameters, but things like reactor coolant temperature, uh, secondary system temperature, steam generator levels that don't aren't necessarily related to the actual startup, but there have been startups that were called off because some other parameter was outside of band. And really, you just want to make sure the plant is super stable when you're when you're doing any big task like coming up for an outage or starting up the reactor. Seems like they had two, uh, pro probably more parameters indicating that things would have been different. I'm curious who thought the, the lithium-7 or all the other parameters that led to the device being much more powerful than they initially thought. wonder what happened with those guys. The fish were making them sick, and the crops were either gone or again sickening. There was cesium-137 in the coconut milk. The 82 residents allowed to return had to be re-evacuated. Uh. By 1963, nine years after the bomb, according to secretive medical studies, the natives of the larger Marshall Islands were developing thyroid tumors. When Bravo detonated, 29 children eventually encountered fallout, and 20 of them developed tumors. That's from iodine-131, which iodine is naturally uptaken in the thyroid. That's the main dose parameter that is used in off-site dose assessments post-accident for your emergency response plan at a nuclear plant. and. Since this weapon contains fission products, because it uses fission, even though it's a fusion weapon, it's kind of a non-indicative name because all the energy comes from fusion, but the thing that gets you to fusion is fission. It's going to have some of those same hazards that would come from a nuclear accident, or specifically a nuclear accident with radiological re release. Now had a mortality rate for cervical cancer 60 times higher than that of the American women on the mainland. Breast and colon cancer risks increased by five times, lung cancer by three times. Birth defects were reported. Island men started dying from oral cancers at a rate ten times what it was before Bravo. Yeah, clearly. The Castle Bravo explosion of This is an example where it's obviously due to the effects of, of the weapon. There are cases of cancer. I mean, it's, it's a big probabilistic thing, but compared to, say, the Three Mile Island accident where... There were not any cancers that were beyond that of the normal rate of people de gradually developing cancer over time. Something like this, it's way more obvious. We contaminated more than 7,000 square miles of the Pacific Ocean. 15 islands and atolls were affected. 253 residents felt some form or consequence of radiation sickness. And by 1995, the Nuclear Claims Tribunal reported that it had awarded nearly its entire fund. $43.2 million to 1,196 claimants for 1,311 radiation-induced illnesses. The fallout from the Castle Bravo test was the worst in human history. Miners at the Los Alamos National Laboratory had made a mistake. Castle Bravo's fusion fuel was 40% lithium-6 and 60% lithium-7, an isotope with an extra neutron. At the time, lithium-6 was scarce and expensive, so a compromise was made to add lithium-7 to make up the rest of the mixture. Mm, okay. And it was that compromise that led to something that some of the smartest people on the planet either discounted or just didn't expect. This is still very early in the atomic age, for lack of a better term. So during World War II, one of the reasons why Little Boy and Fat Man were so different is because Little Boy used so much uranium-235. The majority of uranium-235 that existed 
at the time because large scale enrichment didn't exist during during World War II. So here it's just another period of we're still figuring out how this sort of stuff works with the lithium-6 and 7. During the fusion reaction in the secondary of a thermonuclear bomb, the inert lithium-7 is supposed to absorb a neutron, become lithium-8, and then decay into two helium nuclei in about a second. The probability Now, game. one second is extremely quick, but on the timescale of a nuclear blast, it might as well be a lifetime. The thinking yep. was that when everything is over in just milliseconds, it shouldn't matter what some element like lithium-7 did when it could have already been vaporized a thousand times over in a fireball. This was the mistake. You see, in everyday physics, lithium-7 should behave as we just described, but in the atomic apocalypse that is a fusion reaction, lithium-7 is hit with neutrons with vastly more energy. Smashed Best by high-energy particles, lithium-7 almost instantly decays into a helium nucleus, tritium, and another neutron. If you recall, tritium is the real fuel of a thermonuclear device, and neutrons are the particles that sustain the chain reactions of both fusion and fission. The result was a much more efficient fusion reaction than calculated by Los Alamos scientists. What was supposed to be a 5 megaton bomb detonated with 15 megatons of TNT energy equivalent, 60,000 trillion joules. Because of this so-called tritium bonus, the blast of... You could say this super weapons design had gone horribly right in terms of making a destructive weapon. This is about a thousand times more powerful than Hiroshima, by the way. So Bravo had the same total energy as all the bombs the Allies dropped during World War II combined. That includes Hiroshima and Nagasaki, by the way. The 23-man crew of the Japanese fishing boat Daigo Fukuyu Maru was supposed to trawl for tuna near Midway Atoll. Instead, after losing many of their nets in the Midway Sea, they changed course. They now headed to the south, towards the Marshall Islands, and towards Bikini Atoll. On the morning of March 1st, the Lucky Dragon was unknowingly just a few kilometers outside of the projected danger area for the Castle Bravo test. The small fishing vessel was not detected on radar or by spotter planes in the air that day, and so wasn't warned off by mm. the U.S. military. And, as fate would have it, the unlucky ship was also to the east of Bikini Atoll that day, where the wind wasn't supposed to be blowing. That is one of the big things about fallout um, or radioactive releases from a nuclear accident, is a lot of it depends on which way the wind's blowing. So dose assessments when an emergency plan is active are continually updated just looking at the wind. A nuclear power plant has its own MET tower. The plant I worked at actually had two, and one had to be functional at all times. Otherwise, there's additional emergency planning steps, which basically involve coordinating with National Weather Service and getting a different type of uh, dose assessment teams to act as backups on standby should an event occur. That's one of the things about emergency planning is you have, you're, have to always be ready because whenever accidents occur, they always occur at the most inconvenient time. One of the biggest factors is, is the height of the deton detonation. Another one is the weather or how bad the fallout is. The Lucky Dragon wasn't damaged by the blast, but like the test personnel watching, the men witnessed an expanding light brighter than the sunrise. As one of the fishermen Probably wrote in them. a journal, quote, Nine minutes later, a roaring sound Depending arrives like overlapping avalanches. Bang, 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 bang. An awful sound like the Marshall Islands are sinking as angry waves into the sea. That amount of energy, 15 megatons, is comparable to certain volcanic eruptions. Like the Mount St. Helens eruption was about 20 megatons, so... One of the men, Oshi Matashichi, reported that when the dust started to fall, he took a lick of what he described as powdered snow. Don't, he said it was no. gritty and had no, no taste. He didn't know what it That's was. That's never a good idea. It was atomized sand and coral from the Castle Bravo explosion, and it was contaminated with strontium-90, mm -hmm. cesium-137, selenium-141, and uranium-237. Fission products peak at around the things with atomic mass of 80 to 100 and 120 to 140, and those can be quite radioactive and or, possibly both, quite toxic. The dust stuck to their clothes, got in their eyes, inside their noses and ears, accumulated in their underwear, settled in their lungs. Understandably alarmed by the oddly colored rain and ash, the crew set into hauling all the lines and processing all the fish to escape the area, get back to Japan as quickly as possible. But quickly was a full six hours. 
yeah. radiation sickness set in before they were done. And that's the other thing. Your baseline nausea from being at sea probably ain't going to be zero with just the effects that it would have had on on the ocean causing a bunch of waves and stuff so yeah stack radiation sickness with rough seas and when it was first docked at the fish market in yaizu you could detect the irradiated ship from over a hundred feet away over the next few days the entire crew of the lucky dragon number no. five would be transferred to tokyo university hospital some would remain there for up to 14 months and one man wouldn't remain at all Radiation was attacking their bone marrow so intensely it was interfering with their body's ability to make blood cells in the first place. And to add insult to grave injury, contamination in the hospital at some point during the multiple blood transfusions gave all the crew hepatitis. In the third week of August, Kubuyama... Wow. Hepatitis plus radiation sickness? Couldn't imagine. Kichi started to die. He presented with meningitis, forced doctors to strap him to the floor with madness and fell into a coma and developed pneumonia. Good lord! Kubayama became the first victim the of a thermonuclear horrific. bomb when he died on September 23, 1954. Though the rest of the Lucky Dragon's crew would be released the following May in 1955, another crewman died six months later, and another still reported a pregnancy that ended with a stillborn, deformed child. Fetuses are especially vulnerable to radiation. There's a reason why the uh, for radiation workers, pregnant workers, their dose limits are one-tenth of that of a non-pregnant radiation worker. The official position of the United States after the Castle Bravo test was that the danger zone for fallout did not include the Lucky Dragon and denied that its crew had been exposed to any fallout whatsoever. Mm. It also claimed that the unexpected yield increase did not equal an unexpected increase in radioactive fallout. When the United States later expanded the danger zone for the test, the Lucky Dragon joined an estimated 100 other ships exposed to some sort of death ash. Obviously, as the news about Castle Bravo got out, panic and political pressure followed. One zenith of public outrage came when Sir Joseph Rotblatt, a Polish physicist, published a paper questioning the official reports, and he was the perfect man to do so. Rotblatt had felt personally betrayed that nuclear bombs were used on Japanese cities to end World War II, and had recently done months worth of lectures on why all research on nuclear weapons should cease. And so, after Castle Bravo, Rotblatt did the physics himself to reveal not only that Castle Bravo was a multi-stage weapon for the first time to the public, it was a thousand times more radioactive, more dirty, than what the United States was claiming. Why would anyone believe this lone scientist? Well, in 1944, Rotblatt wasn't lecturing or teaching or- One of the reasons why it was so much more dirty was it was detonated low on the surface. It wasn't an airburst designed to, to do an attack. That's going to cause way more contamination. ...against nuclear weapons, he was working on the Manhattan Project. He was the only scientist to leave the project on grounds of conscience. While the Americans were downplaying the true cost of Castle Bravo, Rotblatt published his paper, which was quickly and understandably picked up by an increasingly tense Japanese government and public. The resulting outcry in Japan strained diplomatic tensions to the point of breaking, and they almost ceased altogether. Now, things may have changed now, but in, in history classes in, in high school with, within the U.S., at least when I went to high school, they mentioned things like, yes, more powerful nuclear weapons were developed, tested. I want to say they alluded to criticality things such as the Demon Core and early experiments, but this aspect of nuclear weapons testing wasn't brought up, or at least not brought up as much as it should have. Some of the Japanese public and government officials had dubbed the fallout from the Castle Bravo test a second Hiroshima. The two countries eventually came to an agreement, though, and the U.S. transferred $15.3 million to Japan, as well as the equivalent of $53,000 to each of the surviving Lucky Dragon crew members. The term Second Hiroshima, um, I can see that being a thing that was, that was said, but in terms of the physics, it was more like a, what you're actually dealing with is a thousand times more powerful, not a deliberate attack, but a surface detonation that's going to cause way more contamination per unit intensity of, of the weapon. It also makes me wonder why they, the term Second Hiroshima, because when I think of Second Hiroshima, I, I think of 
Nagasaki. So, I mean, this this video is actually the first time I've heard it referred to as a second Hiroshima. Joseph Rotblatt's paper and the incident overall was a real turning point in public awareness of the dangers posed by nuclear weapons. And so in 1963, the world's governments would ban atmospheric nuclear testing. And Rotblatt will win the Nobel Peace Prize in 1955. International furor over a simple mischaracterization of lithium meant that the U.S. was forced to reveal that it had the ability to make deliverable thermonuclear weapons, and more importantly, it had to reveal that information to Cold War adversary Soviet Russia. The test was supposed to be a secret. I don't see how you cover up something like that, though, because it's, it's very obvious to realize what happened with someone that knows anything about nuclear weapons. Though, I mean, granted, it was less, less common, but... Nuclear weapons had existed for several years at this point, so it wouldn't be too hard to, to put that together. So it, it would have been found out either way. I don't, I don't think that's really that much of a factor. But not everything that happened as a result of Castle Bravo was so bleak. The radioactivity of Bikini Atoll is a favorite theory of the origin of the mega popular cartoon SpongeBob <laughs> SquarePants. Go. And gazing at a crater while flying over Bikini Atoll in 1954, Film producer Tomoyuki Tanaka would go on to create a film to really capture Japanese fears of nuclear annihilation. Godzilla. It was a monster movie that opened with a fishing vessel encountering radiation. And that film was the original Godzilla. And if you want to see history for yourself, The Lucky Dragon was deemed safe for public viewing in 1976 and is currently on display in its- That says something about the difference, though. Uh, to the Americans, this created a goofy, lovable cartoon character, and to the Japanese, it created a giant monster that destroyed cities. Okay. That was another very well done video by Kyle Hill. All of these nuclear disasters were something that was entirely preventable and could have been avoided. Those strict test parameters, procedures, simply didn't exist back then. Same thing with the with the Demon Core experiments, this is a another painful reminder of why we have those things. Thank you very much for watching. I'll see you next time.